determine what's right. There are other, I suggest, more common ways to determine what's right. We rely on authority. The government, or my father says, or my mother says, this is what you must do. Why? Because I'm your dad, that's why. I'm the authority. We rely on tradition. We've always done it this way. It's the best way to do it. We know that. We've always done it this way in my family, my church, my university, my community. We've always, tradition is powerful. But we rely on the law. We rely on legal authority. If you go down and go over, down and cross into the stop sign, I've got to stop. It's the law. You know that. That tells you what or we rely on the revealed truth of the religion. And that's often done without examination to determine if we see the whole world we tend off despite our best efforts to support it. And finally, we know what to do by reason. This is the hard part. By reason. The ability to think, to make judgments. Draw conclusions requires careful thought and judgment, and often the very right answers. It's not easy. We tend to emphasize positive results of our work and ignore its ethical foundation. I suggest that if one's ethical foundation, how to determine what you want to do, is intolerant, unkind, results are not good independent profit, crop yield, or scientific prestige, you have the wrong foundation. We're all born with a sense of what's right and wrong. But that sense is often unexamined and it's not supported by careful reasoning. The truest test of the moral condition of any discipline, indeed of one's life, is your willingness to examine its moral condition. A guide toward deciding what one ought to do is found in their ethical principles. They are guides, not answers. Ethics is what we all have. You all have. And we're all ethical people. Ethics is a set of societal principles that tells us what we are to do what is right and wrong. However, ethics is not for it's not a set of prohibitions. It's just, it's not a symbol of do not rules. Do not do this, do not do that. That's not what ethics is all about. It's not an ideal but useless system. A, theory, a system that is noble in theory, but useless in practice. The reverse is true. An ethical judgment that is no good in practice has serious theoretical faults. Ethics is not relative or subjective. It's not just your opinion or my opinion. Many think ethical acts are often deemed to be right or wrong by the society we're using. There's no moral judgment that can do more than reflect the customs of society in which you live. In my country, in the 1860s, slavery was fine. It was acceptable. Now we know that's wrong. My society made a moral judgment then it was wrong. In Nazi Germany, Jews were killed because they were Jews. We know that's wrong. But if you'd been a German in the 1930s, you would have known it was right if you accepted the cultural mores of your society. There is a practice that is horrible, practiced in much of the world, called female genital mutilation. It's wrong. There's no question about it. And I can tell you why it's wrong. You can tell me why it's wrong. When I say these things are wrong, am I only saying that my society says they're wrong? Or is it based on some firm moral foundation? Ethics deals with values, deals with principles and beliefs. You determine what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad. Morality is what good people believe to be right and wrong. And they're often used as synonyms. Ethics and morality are used as synonyms. And we use ethical terms every day. You use them every day. Something good, something bad. You say that all the time. Something immoral, something moral. Something's right, something's wrong. That's an ethical decision that you make quite easily. Something is just or it's unjust. 
you decide. You use the Spirit all the time. And we have personal matters. Marital sex is a personal decision. You don't have to tell anybody about it. It's your decision. Whether you vote or not in an election is your decision. My father-in-law said, yeah, I vote, but I'm not going to tell you who I vote for. It's his personal ethical decision to be vote for. Whether you go to church or not, it's your decision. But what am I not like to decision? What? It's your decision. Whether you give to charity or not, it's a personal decision. It's a personal ethical standard. There are social ethics. Thou shalt not murder. Your society tells you that. People do. But we all know it's wrong. We shouldn't practice torture. Or not. In my country, for a long time, you could not open a pornographic bookstore within a thousand years of grade school. I'm kind of dumb, but it's a judgment about pornography. Civil rights is a social thing. You can't beat your children. You can't mistreat your children. You can't lock them in a closet and not feed them. It's wrong. It's a social ethical standard. We have professional ethics. All of you in science have professional ethics. Don't fear the thing today. Don't break it up. Give credit. Be honest. Report all the results. Don't plagiarize. Because it's not the website now that will catch you if you play. Report conflicts of interest. These are professional ethical standards that all scientists share. The goals, the goals of any society are to help create a society that is just, peaceful, generally prosperous, democratic, free of prejudice and humane. We all want that kind of society. You want that kind of society. And that standard gone wrong. I am afraid of to switch off the mystery of the room to concentration and child labor and torture. There's something wrong with the ethical standard of that society when these things happen. We know that. And we know why these things are wrong. Ethical standard change. My story is when I first got married, I was lucky enough to get young. Testosterone was flowing in abundance. You know, I wanted to sleep with my bride, but I knew if I did, my father-in-law wouldn't kill me, but serious pain would have been important. That standard changed now. My children have all lived with their both wives before they got married. I'll bet that happens to you. That's a sexual practice that changes. And that's what changes society has changed. This is how grocery stores in my country now open 24 hours a day, seven days a day. It used to be when you flew at an airplane, you went to dinner at a restaurant, people smoke. Not anymore. No smoking at airplanes. In my country, no smoking at restaurants. I haven't seen people smoke in restaurants here. Either. That's a standard that has changed. How we treat animals. You can't be cruel to your animals anymore. used to be there as a problem. Who is your problem? Not to you anymore. Is there an ethical position that characterizes agriculture? It characterizes the practice of keeping your art practice in the way you want to. Yes. The central norm of agricultural science is production. We produce food to feed the world. That's what we do. So I ask you, is that a sufficient criteria for judging what we do? Producing food and fire is better for the man. Is that sufficient? Is production a sufficient criteria? Does it justify everything? Everything we do. That is a question I leave with you. I'm not going to tell you the answer. I'm suspicious that it does not justify all the practices that we have. We have responsibility. Agriculture has specific responsibility. We need to develop a system that's sustainable. If you type sustainability into the word process or process control, it would inevitably tell you that it's a spell. Because it's not a word that people know about. Everybody's for sustainability. Everybody. Sustainability is like God and mother that nobody can answer. The question is, what do you want to sustain? And what do you take to do that? We have to decrease pollution. It's an agricultural responsibility. We have to eliminate or reduce soil erosion. We have to eliminate harm to other species that we can share this planet, plant and animal species. We have to end habitat destruction, and agriculture does that. 
We have to end water pollution. And we have to stop mining water for irrigation. In my state, I am a peasant farmer. I irrigate. And 90% of the water in my state, Colorado, is used by agriculture. And a lot of these issues, we should stop doing that. That is correct, though. Johnson Swift, Dalton Johnson, written in 1726. And he gave us his opinion that in order to make two years of corn and blades of grass, grow upon a plot of ground where only one grew before, to deserve better mankind, and do more essential service to this country than the whole race of politicians. Agriculture people love that line of our politicians. There it is. That's the ethic for agriculture. Is it adequate? Is it adequate? We have assumed that it is adequate. We produce food. What's more comprehensible about the use of food? As long as our research and our technology increase food production and food availability, we and the end users are somehow exempt from negotiating and renegotiating more about this moral bargain at the foundation of the modern democratic state. We're already right. We don't have to. We are. It's a moral good for you people. Period. It is. The moral good for you people. There's no question about that. Agriculture does that. Therefore, we assume that anyone who questions the morality of our action, the morality of the agricultural enterprise, and the results of this technology simply doesn't understand the importance of what we do. They don't get it. It is assumed that researchers are technically capable and that good results of technology make them morally correct. Food production goes up. We are obliged to question that assumption. When the various American author, a small farmer in Kentucky, he says we have lived by the assumption that what was good for us would be good for the world. We've been wrong. For I do not doubt that it is only on the condition of humility and reverence before the world that our species will be able to remain today. We cannot destroy our habitat. We cannot continue to harm the environment because we are actually dependent on it. We exploit the environment now. So, here are some of the ethical concerns. I told several people as I have been with different groups around the campus here that if you went down in the road, and you walk up and down the street, and if you're a young man, you stop every other pretty girl that you found and say, tell me about pesticides. They're poison, they're harmful, they use too many, they're polluting. Pesticide contamination is a big concern among your society. So are the other concerns. How do we treat animals? The loss of family farms, the number of small farmers are disappearing, and corporate agriculture are societal concerns. If these are just fringe concerns, there's a bunch of wackos out there, dumb people who don't really understand what we're all about, then we don't have a problem. But if there's societal concerns, lots of people think about these things, agriculture has an ethical dilemma. Are there definite answers or answers? Are my answers no? Because this is our moral compass. It's right, probably. It, uh, it's probably right, it depends on what it is. It's an aesthetic decision. It's completely personal. It's all subjective. It's wrong for now. It's right tomorrow. I'm not sure. It's a matter of culture. What, what we decide in the United States is going to be different from what you decide. It's just culture. Who cares? That's our moral compass. That's how we think about how we make that decision. So ethics for agriculture. Why is it common to believe that there are no definite answers in that? There are no ethical facts. And there aren't any ethical facts. There are several arguments. The one I want to give you is the verifiability argument. In agriculture, there's no objective proof of 
exactly what it is that we should do and the verdict's not acceptable. But in ethics, it's not possible to prove that one opinion is right and another opinion is wrong. That's all just your opinion. Two or false, it's your opinion. Therefore, we can prove there's no such thing as objective truth in ethics. But one sees that in ethical matter, the people ask for a different standard of, of proof. The tendency is to use an appropriate standard of proof. You know all about statistics. You can't publish your data unless you statistically analyze your data and show that it is correct within 5% or 10%. They ask for an appropriate, an inappropriate standard of proof based on science. In ethics, proof is not based on your data. It's based on your reasons and how good they are. And they confuse proving with persuading. You can't convince somebody that's stupid that you're right. Maybe the person next to you, but if somebody's not, if they're dumb, you can't convince them. And people have strong beliefs, especially about very difficult questions. What do you do about abortion? What do you do about nuclear war? What do you do about pesticides? What do you do about homosexuality? We're working on those things. What do you do about slavery? We know. What do you do about women's rights? We know. We resolve them. Other difficult questions we are working on. And we forget that there are some scientific questions where we don't agree. How old is the universe? Are all diseases infectious? These are scientific questions. We don't have to think about that. Agriculture is the essential human activity. The essential human activity. And in my view, it must have a firm ethical foundation. Without it, we're found. We don't know why we do what we do. We don't know the reasons to justify our actions. Our work is not just about results. It's not just that we increase production. That's what we think it often is about, but it's not just that. We should not assume that because we believe in what we do, and we do, and the result has been good, that automatically we have society acceptability. Three points about that. Those engaged in that of you are certain about the moral correctness of what you do. You know it's good. The basis of that moral certainty is not obvious to those who have it. Why is what you do correct? Why is it right? And agriculture's moral certainty is potentially harmful because it's unexamined. Socrates told us so many years ago, an unexamined life is not so Think about what you do. Moral certainty and the lack of moral debate, the lack of continuous discussion about what agriculture ought to do. Debate will reveal the foundational theories that justify, that inform you how you decide what's right. And what we'll find is guides, not absolute rules. The guide won't fit every situation, but it'll fit most situations. It will help you decide. It's the invisible foundation, and it should not always be invisible, but it's the invisible foundation on which our actions rest. Exploration of the moral certainty positive for agriculture will not reveal a single guiding principle. It will not solve all agricultural dilemmas. It will reveal several principles that can be used. The benefits and costs of modern agriculture are, in my view, and many others, the greatest story never told. The greatest story never told. Few of any other segment of the world's technological enterprise has such an impressive record. We're good at what we do. Western agriculture is a productive model. A productive model. Science and technology have created steady yield increases. They hope that a higher yield income market. Look at dairy and your own plant here to grow here and you'll be synthetic fertilizer, better soil management, better tillage, improved vegetables, achievements of agriculture. Great story never told. Without the yield increases that have occurred since 1960, the world would 
would now require an additional 10 to 12 million square miles to reach the food and health bridge. If we were still operating at $19.60 ten dollars, we'd have to have 10 to 12 million more square miles, which is equivalent to the land area of the United States, Europe, and Brazil combined. It's not fair, folks. It isn't that much land for us. All the land we have is being farmed. Modern high yield agriculture, therefore, may not be one of the world's problems, but rather the solution provides the achievement for all. And agriculture producers are proud of these achievements, and they also do. The monetary rewards of the agriculture system are handsome for the survivors, the farmers who are still farming. Agriculture's productive capabilities have been enhanced by science, they've been discovered by science, and it's not surprising. If the endless pursuit of production is conflicted with some societal values, agricultural technology has always exposed people to risks. But the risks in the past were borne by the illusion of the technology. Now, a lot of people are worried about the risk of consuming food because they can't stop eating. They have to eat. They might consume something that will harm them or will harm my children. Technology is developed. In their moral certainty, has not secured or even considered how to, how to acquire the public consent. One of the principles of democracy, we live in a democracy, one of the principles is you get to participate in the decision about what's going on in the society. Anybody ask you no, I don't ask you. It's imposed upon you. It exposes people to involuntary risk. Agricultural people must participate in the dialogue that leads to social consensus about risks. And we don't. Diet. Talk. In an agriculture, I know in my experience in weed science, my colleague would often say, just shut up. Shut up and listen to it. I'll tell you what's right about food science. I'll tell you what's right about herbicide. So just be quiet, listen to me. And don't turn it around and say, tell me your story. We don't listen. We need to begin to listen. We need to have that dialogue. What's the problem? What's the problem? Is it production? Of course it is. Of course it's production. You have to maintain production. But what about distribution? We produce enough food in this world right now to feed everybody on the planet 2,700 kilocalories per day. It's there. Do they get it? No. It's a distribution problem. What about waste? The Institute of Mechanical Engineers in London did a study that they published in 2015 that provided data that about 50% of the total world food production is thrown away. It's never eaten. That's a problem that we can solve. And then there's poverty. The poor people can't afford to it. They don't have land to grow up with. These things combine to find the problem that agriculture has to face. Production must remain a dominant goal of any agricultural society. We live in a morally pluralistic world, and we are compelled to ask if more production is only way right does that justify it? What other goals ought we to consider as participants in agriculture? We need to come up with a social goal for the society's sustainable, environmentally safe production system. I suggest we do not have a sustainable system now. We do not have an environmentally safe system now. We exploit the environment. And that should meet human needs. And it should contribute to a just social order. There's no inherent objection in the agriculture community to achieving a just social order. That's not what we do. That's somebody else's problem. That's not my I can do Just social order, great idea. But I don't do that. There are environmental goals for agriculture. And they should not be divorced from social goals. They go together. Sustainability is regarded by people in agriculture as sustained production. That's it. That's what we do. That's what we want to sustain. Is that the only thing? So the view of sustainability depends on what it is you want to 
We make assumptions. We all make assumptions. But we don't want our assumptions to be challenged. We want to lose our assumptions. We don't want anybody to say, hey, wait a minute, that's wrong. A comment by the Russian author, Russian author, Neil Tolstoy, made in He said, Tolstoy said, I know that most men, not only those considered clever, but even those who are very clever and capable of understanding the most difficult scientific, mathematical, or philosophical problems, can seldom discern even the simplest and most obvious truth, if it be such that it obliges them to admit the falsity of the falsity of conclusions to which they are proud, to which they have talked to others and on which they have built their lives and this may be false. That's a really lesson for all those things here. Agriculture is very important. It is productive. It is scientific. You know about those. Agriculture is environmental. The largest interaction, human interaction with the environment. It is economic. Many of your fathers and mothers are farmers, they have to make a profit, so you can go to school. It's not a bad thing to make a profit. It's social, it's political, and it's moral. The moral part of the government is profit. We live, you live, in a post industrial information age society. I'll bet if you get a survey, every one of you in here has a cell phone. You probably all have computers. You live in this information in society, but we do not. And no one ever will live in a post agricultural world. Agriculture is the essential human activity. All societies have an agricultural foundation, and our challenge is to make sure that foundation is secure. I conclude with a couple of questions. My source is Paul Bouvain, a French artist. He went to Tahiti in 1897. This is his masterpiece, produced in Tahiti. In the upper left-hand corner of this masterpiece, he posed three questions. To the Nambu, to Sambu, to Alon. For those who are powerful, say, where do we come from? Where are we?
without insert. Um, Joey Barry from IPS. Um, I would like to ask whether what would be your prediction of the agricultural developments or technology in the next 20 years, say between the first world countries and the third world countries. And my second question is, will, if you have a technology, technologically advanced uh, items in agriculture, will you be more, uh, I mean, less ethical in your standards? No, no Well, that's beautiful. About 70% of 
goes up from uh, A philosophy also. Uh, my question is, um, in your opinion, if ever agricultural ethics will be established as a main or as a branch of ethics that we will follow, uh, what do you think should be the standards that we must uh, that we must uh, adhere or the limitations of the aspects that we must think of uh, in regarding to the to the scientific and technological pursuits that we are trying to do in the agriculture sector of the community. And second is, um, up to what extent do you think it is still just that we, uh, it is still just to sacrifice some factors or aspects of the environment? For the sake of humanity. Say that last bit again. For the sake of humanity. For, for the human sustenance. For the sustainability. My responsibility coming here at a grant from the U.S. Fulbright is to talk to your family. Thank you. 
environmental factors for food security.